What is up you guys? Welcome back to my channel and if you're new here, just welcome. My name is Gemma Jade, but today we are going to be discussing a man named Montague Summers who was allegedly a real life vampire and witch hunter. In my constant hunt for tales of real, factually documented immortal vampires throughout the centuries, I sometimes come across articles about things that are almost as interesting and somehow related and I decide to bring them to you all here. Based on conversations I've had with many of you guys both on YouTube and off of it, I know that so many of you are just as interested in the immortal, undead type of vampire as I am and it's always a good time when I get to write about them in any capacity at all. Today I'm bringing a video to you about something that never even really occurred to me, a vampire hunter. There are so many movies that have been made about this exact thing that you would think I would have thought of this sooner, but in a way I'm glad that I didn't because I found someone who was apparently not only a vampire hunter, but a witch hunter too. And it seems he was all about getting rid of both of these types of people in order to ensure they couldn't ensnare any other human beings into their traps and turn them into soldiers for the devil. I mean, I don't personally believe that about witchcraft and only somewhat believe that the undead and my beloved vampires serve Satan, but we're not talking about the modern day ideas or versions of either of those. And please be sure to note that now before going forward and having some mean or harsh words for me in the comments afterwards. Okay, we are not talking about a witch, right? We're talking about the idea of witchcraft as it pertains to when this dude was alive and centuries before. As many of us know around here, there have been so many people who have come out as paranormalists and really made their mark not only in their field of expertise and service, but in history as well. I mean, that's one of my ultimate and main goals, to have my own television show where I don't have to BS anyone, BS about anything, or act a fool for ratings, but hey, a girl can dream, right? Some of those aforementioned pioneers have shed light and brought people's attention to things that no one had ever considered before, and also they stood up for the people who had experienced they were too scared to admit to having because of how experiencers and those with certain abilities were treated back in the day and the things that were done to them. But sometimes someone will come along and bravely validate with facts and evidence or the closest one can get to facts and evidence in this community and in certain fields, other people's experiences. I found a particularly mysterious and incredibly bizarre individual who even stands out amongst us on this channel, the Island of Misfit Toys, the Gemstones, the Tribe. This guy, like, we might have looked at him sideways. So I wanted to take some time to get to learn about this guy with you guys. This man has been called, quote, an historical supreme paranormalist who broke boundaries, pushed limits, was an honored academic yada, 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 end quote, and who also happened to be a so-called weirdo of the strangest sort in the form of a self-professed witch and vampire hunter. I've come across a lot of information about this seemingly crazy old guy named Montague Summers, so let's jump right in. Montague Summers was born in Clifton, near Bristol in England, on April 10th, 1880. His very wealthy evangelical Anglican family played a huge role in his beliefs and upbringing, but as he got a little bit older, he started to gravitate more towards Catholicism and even studied theology at Clifton College, Trinity College, Oxford, and at Lichfield Theological College as well. He wanted to graduate and become a Catholic priest. And because of that fact, he became a curate apprentice as a curate at the Diocese of Bitton, Bitton? B-I-T-T-O-N near Bristol. But it was here where people started to notice that he was, you know, a little different. He had a wide range of eccentricities that started to pour out over the surface and eventually, as was normal for the people of the time who dared to think or behave a little differently than anyone else, he quickly became involved in, in the middle of a scandal. He was accused of somehow harassing some of the church choir boys, but that's where the information on that ends because although he was accused and people's tongues were definitely a wagon, no charges were ever filed against him. I tried to find more information, but... There really isn't that much, if any. So make of that what you will. 
Montague wasn't going to be deterred by any scandal or any setback, and eventually he went ahead and converted to Catholicism. In 1909, he started claiming that he was already an ordained priest. I say that's when he started claiming that he was an ordained priest because there's absolutely no evidence that he actually was one, and there's no record at all of him being registered as ordained anywhere in any diocese in Britain, nor was he ever mentioned or named on any list of Catholic order. Now, think what you will, but they kept very, very strict records back then, and in fact, they still do. So to me, that says a lot right off the bat about his character and what he was willing to do to get by or to perhaps get ahead. But that's just me. He nevertheless insisted that he was a priest and started holding masses both publicly and privately nonetheless, and regardless of whoever believed him and who did it. So Montague decided to start calling himself quote, the Reverend Alphonsus Joseph Mary Augustus Montague Summers, end quote, which in my humble opinion merely makes him sound boastful, prideful, and like a pompous ass if I ever did hear one. But I digress, and to support himself, he started teaching English and Latin at several schools, but he despised the work, and he was looking for something to do to better himself, and that was better for himself the entire time he was teaching. Despite not liking teaching work, it seems he was incredibly good at it. He was an incredibly good speaker, and it said he would absolutely mesmerize the people he taught all throughout England because he was funny, charming, and stylish, and basically, he didn't give a flying F word about what anyone said or thought. His intense and engaging manner of teaching and speaking made him very popular, especially with his students. What Montague really wanted to do was write, and he often did, but not really as a profession. He wrote about theater in the 17th century and restored long-forgotten plays in the style of the English for that century. So the way this was written was a bit confusing, but I think it means that he took plays from centuries before that not too many people knew about and rewrote them in the style of the day. Think of Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet from the late 90s. That's what I likened it to in my head. He was actually considered an extremely important person in the theater community and was said to have been instrumental, that was a quote, in saving the genre of English restoration and other types of dramas from disappearing altogether. And he was also considered the go-to expert on those subjects. This is all very confusing, but I'm sure some of you out there in YouTube land will understand what I just said. So he didn't only write about and restore the plays, but he also performed them and starred in them on stage as well. He formed, for the purpose of the performing alone, the Phoenix Society Drama Organization. He wrote more than a few studies on Gothic fiction, was considered the foremost expert on Gothic literature, and he also wrote his own fictions as well. His style was mainly what he knew, mostly Gothic in nature, and his plays and other works could always be counted upon to take some sort of dark, otherworldly, supernatural space been somewhere in them more towards the end. He became very popular and well respected for all the work he did with both teaching and writing and in 1916 he became a member of the Royal Society of Literature. And let me tell you that was quite an achievement back in the day. He was admired and his writing eventually became his only focus and what he constantly pursued. With all of these accolades and achievements under his belt, you would think old Monty was rather pleased with himself, but you would be somewhat wrong because it was right around this time when his life would become dark, twisted, and downright bizarre. And the main reason I'm writing about him at all, really, I mean, let's be real. Montague Summers wrote so much and so often that people would often wonder if he even noticed the dark, deep, creepy turn his writing was taking and if he even cared that most of his work became deeply enmeshed in the occult and the world of the supernatural, with him being ever more intrinsically drawn to the dark and somewhat oftentimes dreadful world of those same things that he had become quite obsessed with. It was pretty much unheard of for a professor, for a priest, to be writing, first of all, in the Gothic style, and second of all, about the things that he was writing about and having the things happen in his plays, in his writings, that he was. It was unheard of, and it was considered really strange. He became more than a little obsessed with witchcraft, vampirism, demonology, and lycanthropy. Lycanthropy? Especially and honestly, when I read this, I really didn't blame him at all, right? Because I'm kind of obsessed with vampires and to a lesser degree werewolves. I was like, wow, okay, we have something in common, Monty. 
If this makes you a weirdo, then count me in. However, we have to remember the times Montague was living in. And in that case, I have to wonder what in the world he was thinking. But again, no shade and I don't blame him one little bit. He believed that demonology, lycanthropy, witchcraft, and vampirism were worthy of all his studying and literary efforts and everything he wrote reflected that fact. He studied the occult intensely, and it was then that he became acquainted with a so-called contemporary occultist by the name of Alistair Crowley, whom he became almost instant friends with. The two spent hours on end, sometimes days at a time, talking about the paranormal and supernatural in general. So, right around that time, Monty had his interests on full display for all to see. A priest hanging out with Alistair Crowley. I, I, I don't know. It wasn't only in what he wrote about, who he associated with, how he spoke, or the topics of discussion either. It was all over his office and any other personal spaces as well. These places were filled with talismans, amulets, odd statues, and weird figurines. He had all manner of occult paraphernalia, for lack of a better way to put it, out for anyone and everyone to see should they ever speak to him or pay him a visit. His bookshelves overflowed with large volumes covering every single area of the paranormal you could possibly think of or imagine. He wanted everyone to know who he was and what he was about, apparently, as he also started wearing black capes, kind of like what Van Helsing would wear, and he didn't do that or make that connection with himself by accident. He was purposefully dressing like Van Helsing. And if you don't know who Van Helsing is, I'm trying to get enough information together, factual information to do a series on him. He was considered also a vampire hunter, maybe the vampire hunter. I don't know. I never watched any of the movies, never read any of the books, but I just know he was a badass. So basically he resembled Van Helsing, the vampire hunter and not an academic scholar or modern teacher of the times. I only stress all of this because I think it's wild and I applaud him for essentially letting his freak flag fly in a time when such things were extremely dangerous. And honestly, for this, I give the man credit. Montague's biographer, whose name was Brockhard Sewell, said this about him, quote, during the year 1927, the striking and somber figure of the Reverend Montague Summers in black soutoine and cloak with buckled shoes at La Louis Quatorzar and shovel hat could often have been seen entering or leaving the reading room of the British Museum, carrying a large black portfolio bearing on its side a white label showing in blood red capitals, the legend, vampires, end quote. Montague wrote incessantly about vampires and witchcraft specifically and particularly churned novels out one right after the other. Some of his works are titles such as Witchcraft and Black Magic, The Werewolf in Lore and Legend, The Vampire, His Kith and Kin, The Vampire in Europe, The, the Geography of Witchcraft, A Popular History of Witchcraft, and so many others. I can't name them all here, but y'all get the gist, right? Our good old friend Monty was also instrumental in translating several medieval demonological manuals and the 15th century witch hunters manual as well. That one is specifically titled the Malleus Maleficarium and is actually still notorious today in 2023 for its text on how to identify, capture, and then kill witches. He believed with all his heart and soul that particular text was absolutely correct, and he believed in every single word of it when it came to witches and healing the planet of them and their craft. He agreed with all of the extreme philosophies and methods contained therein, and even promoted that getting rid of them was integral and an absolute necessity as pertained especially to the Catholic Church and Catholicism as a whole and at large. He fully believed that they existed, that they were everywhere, and that they needed to be identified and killed in all manner of extreme and brutal ways in order to basically save the world from their evil and demonic influence. For as much as he loved to research and talk slash write about werewolves, witches, and vampires, he didn't applaud or value them and actually wrote and spoke very negatively about them. So while he absolutely did believe that they all definitely existed and he seemed to be very obsessed with them, he felt that they were all a form of evil and in cahoots with the devil, thereby making them, in his eyes, publicly public enemy number one 
I look at this and I laugh knowing what we do today about such creatures while admitting we don't know all that much. Witches have been redeemed a million times over in my eyes, but vampires and werewolves are still very much, they're up in the air. I am in no way, shape, or form being facetious or funny here either, guys, as I wholeheartedly believe in the existence of all of these entities as well, but would love to know more and have that knowledge be based on facts and documented sources, evidentiary proof, before I would advocate for slaughtering any of them on sight. Werewolves included, I might add. Leave your opinions in the comments below, please. Be respectful and have some fun with it, but also understand this was a real person who actually existed. And it's exactly this sort of extremist type thinking and behavior that's plaguing our modern day society right now. But I'll say no more on that because that isn't my genre. You know what I'm saying? Just leave that to the professionals, Gemma. So Montague consistently insisted that all of those creatures must be destroyed on sight, and he minced no words and pulled no punches when speaking publicly about them, and speak publicly about them he definitely did. I'm sure his opinions were just as strong in private too, though. In 1926, he wrote the aforementioned book about witches called The History of Witchcraft and Demonology, and in it he said thusly, quote, In the following pages, I have endeavored to show the witch as she really was, an evil liver, a social pest and parasite, the devotee of a loathly and obscene creed, an adept at poisoning, blackmail, and other creeping crimes, a member of a powerful secret organization, inimical to church and state, a blasphemer in word and deed, swaying the villagers by terror and superstition, a charlatan and a quack sometimes, a bawd, an abortionist, the dark counselor of lewd court, ladies and adulterous gallants, a minister to vice and inconceivable corruption, battening upon the filth and foulest possessions of age. End quote. Well, I guess he was telling us how he really felt. This wasn't only how he felt about witches, though, as I already stated, he felt the same way about all supernatural creatures and entities in general. So I think most of us here on this channel would not stand a chance with this guy around. I'm just saying. To quote M.U., not a big fan of witches then? This was actually his general attitude towards all supernatural creatures and sorcerers in general, and he writes about them in an absurdly old-fashioned, out-of-date style and with such frost frothing vitriol and venom that perusing his works, one might be inclined to think that they are reading some archaic 15th century text rather than something written by a 20th century respected and eminent scholar. Make no mistake about it, Montague Summers was all about the church-sanctioned annihilation of witches, vampires, werewolves, demons, and any other supernatural creature and he wrote about them with such a firm certainty of the reality of these entities and such incredible persuasiveness using historical theological ethnographic and literary sources to support his opinions and citing numerous obscure supposedly real cases of these creatures that it is almost dangerously infectious end quote yeah um that was a mouthful but i will say i was surprised at that quote that I gave to you guys from one of his books, because it was like, who wrote this? It sounds like it's like from Shakespearean times. What they were saying there too, is that he wrote about them with such ferocity and wrote about them citing a supposed factual cases of them attacking or doing whatever it was he said they were doing. He wrote about them with such assuredness and surety that he was easily able to convince people especially because he was such an esteemed man, despite his little um, eccentricities, that people believed that these creatures were all over the place, running amok and hiding in plain sight. This is a type of stuff that leads to things like the Salem witch trials or the witch hunts in general. Even though he had all of this high strangeness going on and was obviously starting to lose himself between the blurred lines of fiction and fantasy, he was well respected among a certain group of his fellow academics, students, and peers as well. He was considered the most expertly expert in Britain when it came to those three creatures and a front runner when it involved the supernatural in general. He was considered a literary elite and some say he was considered the expert, the most knowledgeable human being in the whole world about such subjects and people really listened to him paid attention to what he wrote and he was held in very high regard that baffled me it really baffled me because you would think that someone who ranted and raved like this especially someone who was chilling with the likes of Aleister Crowley and professing to be an ordained Catholic priest 
when there was no proof that he actually was one, in the times he was living in, he would have been an outcast, considered a kook or a quack or something much worse. But instead, people really respected, respected him, liked him, and they really freaking listened to him. In fact, he spoke publicly and privately about these creatures and on these topics so much that by the time he died at the age of 68 in his home in Richmond, Surrey in 1948, there was thought to be no other person on the entire planet who was as knowledgeable on those subjects as Montague Summers. For as much as I disliked this guy with the more that I read about him, learned about him, and looked into his words, plays, and books, I have to admit if you really think about it, he was kind of a trailblazer for those of us today in the paranormal community. He certainly paved the way in that he found a way to make it acceptable to believe what we believe in and still be who we are, both publicly and privately, in a time when to think outside of the box was to be punished, arrested, locked away, and or killed. He opened the door to the greater academic world to study the paranormal and made it somewhat natural, as if not thinking of such things would be what was crazy. I agree with him completely on that one. In my opinion, those who even refuse to consider that there is a paranormal and supernatural realms and worlds all around us, even despite so much evidence to the contrary, especially today in 2023, would be dull, ignorant, and imbecilic. There are many people, though, who have studied his life and everything he wrote, said, and did, along with the way he carried himself, who believe him to be the imbecile in that he was so hateful and full of seething animosity towards the very field and things he dedicated his entire life to. It doesn't make sense to me to seemingly hate the very thing you advocate for and the very marrow of who you seem to be, but, as I always say, who am I to judge? Some people go so far as to call him a monster and judge him harshly on his views, but in a time where this was all very taboo, he brought it to the forefront, and for that, I say we have to at least thank him. Now, the big question that I had at the end of all my research, was this man ever an actual witch and or vampire hunter, though, as he is so often listed as in videos and on websites when looking up this subject? I honestly really don't know. I re At the end of the day, I couldn't find a definitive answer. I couldn't find any information saying that he physically went out on the hunt for these creatures of the night. But with the way he dressed and the things he said, wrote, and believed in, I would say that in a way, he was an actual modern day witch and werewolf or vampire hunter. I mean, who knows if he carried wooden stakes and silver bullets underneath his Van Helsing cape. Hmm. Van Helsing. We keep going back to that. Do you guys want me to try to cover Van Helsing? I've been kind of looking into it on the periphery, but uh, let me know what you would think about something like that. Back when Montague Summers was alive and doing all of this, science was only just starting to beat out so-called illogical superstitions. I did a little digging and found out that the reason he never officially was ordained was because when he was a young man, he dabbled in necromancy and sorcery and was for a little while and sometimes still is considered a sorcerer himself. Before he wore the Van Helsing garb, he did wear the official robes of the priesthood. Some say he may have been ordained in Italy by a small and relatively unknown sect, but I found written and, in my opinion, irrefutable evidence to the contrary. Look, the man was an eccentric for sure, and I wouldn't be surprised at all to learn that he went out at night and hunted the very monsters he was so fascinated by but loathed equally. I wonder if he ever found what he was looking for and if maybe that's why his obsession turned to such vile hatred. Did he have an experience with one of these so-called creatures of the night that made him kind of lose it a little bit and want to do nothing but hunt them? It really does make you think though, doesn't it? That's all I have for you today, guys. Please give this video a big thumbs up if you enjoyed the content, if you enjoyed hanging out with me, and if you enjoyed hanging out with each other in the premiere. Spread the love by sharing this video, please, and be sure to leave a positive comment if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you haven't already, and make sure all of your notification bells are turned on. On Wednesday nights, right here on this channel, you will find myself and Ghost Dragon ZW doing live intuitive oracle from 7 to 7.15ish p.m. Eastern Time till around 11 p.m. Eastern Time, or until we run out of people to read for. We do live intuitive oracle. Come on in, get a random card pulled from a random deck, and I will tell you what's going to happen, what's going on, what your next week or two is going to be like. If you're interested in that and don't really know what it's about, that is a really good way to 
figure it out to find out and see if it's really your thing. I also offer personal readings. Um, information for that will be in the description box below, as well as ways to donate, PayPal, Cash App, my Amazon wish list gift link, and the link to my Patreon. On any given Thursday, you will see myself, Ghost Dragon ZW, and Miss Paranormal Pixie doing chillax in chat at 8 p.m. Also at 8 p.m. on Thursdays, you could end up seeing Miss Lara, Miss Paranormal Pixie. She does her own show here on this channel, Conversations with Lara, the Paranormal Pixie Hour. Friday and Saturday nights at midnight. It's the Ghost Dragon ZW, everyone's favorite Ghost Dragons on Saturday nights. He's doing replays of my old videos, going through them, commenting on them. Friday night, you guys just chill. I don't know what y'all get into over there, but I know it's a very popular show on this channel and it is a good time. Now, every other Monday, we were doing afternoon talk, myself and Ghost Dragon ZW at 12 noon Eastern. This is all Eastern time, but we are moving that to Tuesday. And I believe this coming Tuesday is going to be the first Tuesday we do it because the way it kind of works out is that like next Tuesday I can't. So the Monday that you're watching this video, look for it the next day uh, at 12 o'clock noon. And if you don't see it, obviously you'll see it before it comes up. I'm just a little confused as you can probably tell about the schedule. I will try to put that information in the description box as well. Be kind to each other, guys. It doesn't cost anything. Never accept anything less than others being kind to you. And of course, always be kind to yourself. Links for all of my books on Amazon, the Kindle and paperback in the description box. If you want autographed or signed copies of those, more information about anything I do, anything I sell, uh, personal readings are on sale for $20 for September's readings, which I'm doing this week and next week. So go ahead and PayPal or cash app $20 if you would like one of those before they go back up to 60 guys. If nobody told you today, I believe in you. You're perfect. You're amazing. You are beautiful just the way you are. And if there's someone in your life who can't see that, because I see a lot of this in the intuitive Oracle of people going through a lot of the same types of things. We're empathic. We tend to draw in the wrong type of people because we are also fixers, savers, healers, light workers, don't let anyone make you feel less than, like you're not good enough. Be with someone and be around people who make you laugh, who make you feel loved, where you can just plain old be yourself, no matter how insane or boring you may be, okay? There is a lid for every pot, and I just want you guys to be your best selves all the time. And that's what Intuitive Oracle is really all about, and that's what I hope to accomplish with this channel as well. Always go in grace, smile at a stranger, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.